Hello, I'm Gene Edwards, and tonight on Conversations, Hell at the Breach. It is Tom Franklin's first novel and weaves together historical fact and lyrical prose and blistering action to recount a little-known event in America's dark past. It's a riveting book that is both violent and just and smooth and relentless. And welcome to you, Tom Franklin. Good to Thank have you here. I'm glad to be here. For your very first novel. I'm very excited. How many are in the drawer at home? None. <laughs> this was my first attempt. <laughs> You know, it was it was a sink or swim, and yeah. there's a lot of flailing too before I started to swim a little bit. Was there all that? Uh, you had a, a really wonderful uh, short story collection called uh, the Poachers, which was out three years ago. 1999. 1999, yeah. uh, and all of us were were big fans of that. Did the short story lead you to the novel? Did you always think you wanted to do a novel? What? They were a package deal. Um, I I got an agent, Nat Sobel from New York who read the story Poachers in a journal called Texas Review. He saw it, uh, he reads all the liter literary quarterlies. He saw the story and wrote me a letter and said, I like the story, um, let's talk. So I called him and he said, you know, I like your stories but you have to have a novel too. What I can do if you have a novel or a novel idea is, is put them together in a two book deal. So he asked me uh, if I had novel ideas. I said, I've got a couple. <laughs> I told him, he said, those are terrible. <laughs> he said, the stories are violent. I like the violence. Do you have any novels with yeah. vi uh, novel ideas with violence in them? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, I remember this story. And so I wrote a synopsis, and that's how, how it came about. And off you went. Were you, the, were you the Grisham writer in residence at that point, or were you? This was 1998. No, I was the Gr John, Grisham, John and Renee Grisham writer in residence in uh, 2001, 2002. This was before uh, you know, I anything had happened for me. Were you? I was in graduate school at the University of Arkansas. So I had no idea what Oxford, Mississippi was or any of those. I, I knew of it. I knew of it. Kind of an idea. Yeah. So here you are with uh, uh, this contract to do something and this kind of idea from the past they about gave me these guys, yeah. this mysterious bunch of, is this, it is a true story. Uh, that you've always known about, that your family's always known about? How did you hear about it? Um, it was, it's kind of famous in Clark County, the story of the Mitchum War, and I knew about it because my 11th grade English teacher had relatives who were killed in the war, uh, a great uncle, I think. And I have uncles who tell stories, so I was just always aware of you know, the, the terrible things that happened about 12 miles from where I grew up. Was it a written history? Had someone... It, it became uh, a, a book published by the Clark County Democrat um, called The Mitchell Moore of Clark County, written by three people, or co-authored by three people. Um, Har Hardy Jackson, an historian from, who teaches at Jacksonville State, mm -hmm. and Joyce Burridge, who's my 11th grade English teacher, and Jim Cox, the editor of the local paper, The Democrat. Did they, you get they put this book together and um, based mostly on oral history, you know, on stories told from families. Hardy Jackson's... Um, grandfather, our great-grandfather was involved, and Joyce Burge had a great uncle involved, so, mm -hmm. there, so both sides came together. Both sides of this war met and, you know, and, and came up with this book. This was a Hatfield and McCoy kind of thing. It is kind it? of like that. It's not a feud, per se, in that you know, it wasn't families over time, but it was um, like a class struggle. Yeah, so what was it they were trying to do? Were they trying to keep the peace or keep people out or, or keep the county the way it was or... The Hell at the Breach gang was just trying to make a niche for themselves. They felt they were being downtrodden by merchants from town. Mm -hmm. And there was a, lo a they had a, a, a friend, Rafe Bedsoe, who was running for political office in the late 1880s or early 1890s. He died mysteriously. No one knows you know, how he died, but his relatives suspected he was poisoned by his opponent, who was a doctor. The doctor then fled the county, fearing that he'd be killed by the dead man's family, and he probably would have been. Uh, and out of this, the Health of Breach Gang formed. You know, they formed to take revenge. They formed to make things right, they thought, you know, to, to clean out the outlaws in, in the courthouse. So they weren't, th th there's kind of the feeling that they might have been like the Klan, but they weren't really like the Klan. Were they? No, they did wear white hoods, and so there are si similarities. And Certainly, you know, as with anything in Alabama, especially in the 1890s, there was race involved. Mm. They did terrible things to black and white people. But really, uh, what it came down to was, you know, poor whites against less poor whites. Oh. So here you are, 
in this situation where you have now committed to an agent and to a publisher that you're going to write a novel and you've got a pretty good story, but what don't you have? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a lot of things. I, <laughs> they wanted it in nine months originally, and uh, I spent nine months worrying about not writing it. I wrote one scene about seven pages over those first nine months. I was teaching at the University of South Alabama, my alma mater, and I taught, had four classes per semester and it was not much time to write. Mm -hmm. So I just fretted and wrote the, the one scene and then called my agent and said, you know, he said, how's it going? Are you, are you finished yet? I said, no, I've, I've not written much at all. He said, well, I'll get you an extension. I'm thinking two years. He said, three months. <laughs> I said, thanks. <laughs> and uh, so I had three more months. I didn't write anything. And then it got quiet from New York. I didn't hear anything. And, and the next year, I was the Philip Roth resident in creative writing for half a year. Mm -hmm. and, and that was? That was in Bucknell. Uh, that would have been in 2000, okay. in Bucknell University in uh, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, I wrote about 100 pages there okay. that I didn't wind up using ultimately. And the next year, I was at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, where my wife uh, taught. And uh, that year, I wrote about 200 pages. And you know, nothing from New York. I, you know, I'm thinking maybe they've forgotten about me, hoping they've forgotten about me. Did you me. cash the check? I had cashed the check. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I knew that they would call me sooner or later, and, and they did. My editor called at a good time and, and said, how's it going? And I said, it, you know, it's going okay. And when I got the John Grisham, uh, John and Renee Grisham, a writer in residency at Ole Miss, I had, nothing, I had a year to do nothing but write. I taught one class per semester, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, uh, not easy, but it was very manageable. So I wrote about 500 pages that year. And... Uh, had about a thousand in all that I'd written. At that point, my agent flew down from New York to Oxford. We had a meeting, and he, he read what I'd given him, you know, a lot of pages. He said, okay, you're almost done. Write the ending, and you're finished. And so I, I did that. It was about three years overdue, but, but I shipped it off to him, and, and they were happy enough with it. So, so there you go. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> Somebody told me, though, that, that that you really weren't able to solve the problem of it until you were able to reconcile lying and yeah, fiction, making you know, stuff up. Fi <laughs> fiction is lying that you make true with true life details. Because you had this true story that you were working yes. with, but, but what was wrong with the true story? What was wrong with it for me, um, there were you know, all these events, and I knew, so it had a kind of... The, st the novel had a kind of built-in structure. I knew how it started. I knew how it ended. I knew certain key events. So I was lucky in that way. My problem was that I was trying to stick too closely to the events you know, as they're known. And they're not known well. Mostly what we have uh, you know, is this, this oral tradition, stories passed down from generation to generation. Right. And a lot of people weren't willing to talk about it for a long time. And there are a few newspaper articles that are very biased against the, the, the people from the country, the Hell's a Breach Gang. Mm -hmm. So I, I was struggling to try to keep it within the historical context and try to keep it um, as close to the facts as I could, and I couldn't write it. Those were the two years where I wrote almost nothing. At some point, I was writing about Sheriff Billy Waite, and there, is a, a, there was a real man named, named William Waite, who my character is based on. He was in his late... 20s, and I just could not get a grip on him. I had him riding his horse, looking for a man named Kirk James, who he was going to kill if he found him. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly, I thought maybe I'll give him a backache, because I had a backache at the time. <laughs> I got a bad back, and um, <laughs> so I gave him a backache on his horse, which I thought that must be terrible. Yeah. And at that moment, I, I felt like I knew him a little bit more. And uh, and then I gave. Uh, he got down off his horse to try to you know try to go to the bathroom, you know. Um, try to urinate, and he couldn't. And I thought, okay, he's older. At that moment, he really began to form for me. It, it was that simple, and it's something that I knew, but I'd forgotten. You know, I, I think with every new story you start, every new book you start, you have to relearn how to write. So is that advice that you give people who are in your writing classes? Do they, do they talk about how to get over those Yeah, yeah those are always the big questions. You know, how do you get past writer's block? Yeah. Another great thing that I did... I was at, at some point frozen. I had, you know, I, I was a good way into it, and uh, it must have been when I was trying to write the long ending. There's a long last section that's um, pretty much a kind of massacre scene, mm -hmm. and I was really frozen there. I changed the font on my computer, 
and suddenly it looked different on the screen to me, and when I printed it out, it was different on the pages. That was a lifesaver. It sounds silly, but seeing it in a different way mm -hmm. really helped me. Uh, is your wife a big help in all this? My wife should, or you no know, help should, at should, all. should get credit on the cover. <laughs> she, you know, she sh it should be co-authored by us because she's a poet, Beth Ann Finley. Um, her first book is called Open House. It came out last year. And uh, her next book is called Tenderhooks, coming out next year from W.W. W. Norton. She, uh, every, every novelist or, or fiction writer, story writer should have a poet as uh, his or her editor. Why? Uh, well, in our case, for so many reasons, if I was stuck, and I often was, we would talk about it. We would talk it out. She would say, what's wrong? And I, we'd talk about the characters, and she would give me ideas or just let me talk it out myself and ask the right questions to unlock whatever was, was locked up. She would also give me assignments at some point. She would say, write a scene between Mac and Tuch Betzold today. And I would try it. You know, it, would, it would work or it wouldn't work, but I would at least have direction. She would um, read drafts for me, read scenes for me, listen to me read it to her, mm -hmm. offer suggestions. We brainstormed about plot, elements of the plot. And finally, when I had it uh, in draft, she read it with uh, you know, a green pen. Green, she said, is nurturing. Red is blood. <laughs> she read it with a green pen and line edited it in an amazing way. I mean, she could be a New York editor if she wanted to. Really? I've never seen a better editing job. And I, I will give you a concrete example. There was a really terrible line that I had written. But, you know, it's about a guy who's, who's beating somebody with a shoe. A cobbler has just fixed a shoe, and this guy, Lev James, who's a hothead, uh, is, is beating him with the shoe, and the heel flies off. The heel just put on flies off during during this beating, and the line I wrote was, the line you know the heel flew off and he beat him harder as if uh, sloppy craftsmanship were one more kind of fuel for his angry heart. That's not a good line. No. But then fixed it. She made it as if sloppy craftsmanship were one more kind of fuel for the furnace of his heart. That's a good line. And that's her. And she's that way on every page. Every page she fixed lines. She cut out things that were unnecessary. So the, the words, are the words more precious to her because of the poetry that she writes? Is that? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, poets boil it down to its bare essence. And mm -hmm. she's a wonderful poet. And my favorite of her poems are her narrative poems. And, you know, they tell stories. Those are the ones I can understand a lot better, you know, as a storyteller. And yeah, she just, you know, really gets it to its essence. Did you ever see yourself marrying a poet? Um, <laughs> no, I, I haven't. I didn't. Uh, I'm certainly not one as pretty as she is, uh -huh. you know. My dad tells me I married up. Yeah, and you've got a little girl now. Got a little girl, Claire, who is uh, just over two years old. And there are even more complications to all this yes. writing problem. It's funny, ha having Claire um, really helped me finish the novel. I in that, before her, you know, often I wasn't teaching or had, you know, had summers off or whatever. I had a lot of time, so plenty of time to watch TV or go play tennis or go fishing <laughs> or whatever, go to the bars. With, with Claire, you know, suddenly I had two hours that I better use well, you know, or I wouldn't get any writing done that day. Mm -hmm. And it's also funny that when we had her, the book became filled with birth imagery. Really? I, had a character who, I have a character who's a midwife. Mm -hmm. Who you know who has you know birthed many babies and and all the birth details come from our you know our birth experience getting Claire. Beth Ann <laughs> chose not to take drugs. Really? They took no drugs for the whole delivery. Just you know. Oh. I know. <laughs> I, I, I said they should have given me the drugs. I wanted the epidural. <laughs> you wanted. That. I wanted it. You know. She but she you know I'll stop bragging about her but she she's quite amazing. I can't wait to meet her when she comes out and does her tour. And speaking of tours, uh, you are on one of these. Book tours, my goodness, you're on a yes. book tour. I'm on a massive one. And you're going to go to your hometown. Grove Hill. Where all of these things happened originally. Yes, a lot of them happened in Grove. That's the town. It's, it's a, the Mitchum Beat is about you know, eight or nine miles out from Grove Hill, but a lot of the events happen in Grove Hill. Does it frighten you? Yeah, that it these people me. are going to come in to the, is it a bookstore? It's a gift shop. Oh. Yeah, the gift gallery. Um, okay. And I, actually, I did a signing last night in, a, uh, in, in the wonderful store in Montgomery, Capital Books. And uh, a woman came up to me and said, my great-grandfather was killed. He was the last one murdered in the Mitchell War. He was murdered after, you know, after the novel ends. There right. were a few lingering mm -hmm. um, 
episodes of violence. But that, you know, and, and my, you know, someone told me later they saw my face when she said that, and I looked like a, a deer in the headlights. Because, you know, I'm thinking, is she going to be mad at me? You know, did I use this name? Did I give him a drinking problem? Did I tell the story the right way? Yeah. Did um, people see these people as heroes? Yeah. Well, well some of the, them did? Yes, that's right. Now, the people who I think have a set of relatives, you know, view their, their relatives, uh, you know, as the, the right side. In, in this conflict. And of course, there's n you know, never a totally right or totally wrong side. Mm -hmm. And this is no different. But when I go to Grove Hill, I'm quite nervous because there will be people who um, ha have relatives and, and who have a lot invested in this story. They've, you know, it's been their family story for a long time. They're going to walk in and, and they may have issues. Yes, who am I to tell it? You know, I had no relatives involved that I know of. You know, I, I, was, you know, I grew up in the county. But, you know, what right do I have? And that's a legitimate argument. I, I can see that. So I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to see if my brother will go with me. He's a big guy. <laughs> he can, you know, protect me. <laughs> he can hold the sack with the snakes in it just in case. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but you grew up in that kind of an atmosphere, didn't you? you yeah, I did. You attended did. a charismatic church. and, mm -hmm. and Yeah, w yeah it, w it was a great, you know, a great writer's education to grow up in the woods and, and see all those things, to, you know, to hunt, to hunt and fish and and learn the land and, and that kind of thing. And how did you get out? Or my dad did you us, see it as getting out? Uh, I did see it as that. I, mean, yeah. I think my dad did too. He thought that um, those areas weren't progressing. He wanted to move us to, you know, to an area where we'd all have a better chance. You know, where, and so we moved to Mobile. And you know, I went to South Alabama there. And that was great for me. You know, so I, mean, he, I think he did it for, you know, for his family. Mm -hmm. so, you know, trying to get us in a better environment. Did you know then that you wanted to write? or? How, how have you come to this? How, how have you come to this place? I, well, I'd always, you know, been interested in stories. You know, have my, you know, my father tells stories, my uncles told stories. Uh, as any good, you know, good Southerner ought to get, we all, you know, that's one thing we have is, is a great storytelling tradition. Mm -hmm. So I think I was interested in, in hearing those stories. And I read Edgar Rice Burroughs books as a kid, all the Tarzan novels, and I loved those. So I wrote Tarzan you know, like Tarzan-like stories, Tarzan-esque stories. I read that Arthur uh, Conan Doyle, uh, no, that's Sherlock Holmes. I read, uh, who, who wrote The Conan the Barbarian? Robert E. Howard. Robert E. Howard. I, I read all those books, and then I read Stephen King. I was obsessed with Stephen King, who tells great stories. So, you know, and I just wanted to do that, too, because I liked it. It gave me such pleasure to read these books. I wanted to do the same thing. And I started out writing very bad science fiction horror stories. My favorite example is uh, a story called Borborygmy, which is the medical name for stomach growling. <laughs> and I heard a story that was 100 pages long about a guy stomach growling and telling him the future. And I would have stomach growling sound effects like boy yo 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 and er, <laughs> and I would write it across, you know, r r r r r on my typewriter. And there, it was just such a terrible story. And I guess I was 21 or 2 when I was writing the story. Really? And so you have 21 or 22-year-old students in your classes now. Yes. And, and they're so much better than I was. Uh, you, if, I'd been, if I'd had me in a class, I would have just said to me, you know, just give it up. Give it up. The, the people that I teach now, they're, you know, they're, they're just way beyond. And, you know, they're young. and they're, they're pretty smart kids. They're very smart. And they're reading good stuff. I, I want to ask you about uh, uh, this uh, writer-in-residence program. It, it, if it weren't for these programs, there would be a lot of people out there who just would never, ever, ever get to the place where it could become, it, yes. it could become something. It is a wonderful gift for a writer. You know, it, it, in fact, it's a grant. The, uh, the John and Renee Grisham um, residency, it's, 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 a, it's a gift from John Grisham you know, and Renee Grisham. They're, they're very generous to the University of Mississippi. It, it gives, every year it's for an emerging Southern writer. This next year, um, the writer is Janice Ray. Uh, and last year, um, or who, the one just finishing is, is Shea Youngblood. And it, it gives you a house for a year. You teach one class per semester, which is very manageable. It's not, it's not hard, you know, and it, it gives you a lot of time to write. Are you required to publish as a result of it, or, or do you just feel like you really should? <laughs> I think that, that they choose you on, on the basis of what you've done. You know, and on the hope for what you will do. So your short story collection was already out there. When yes, you were the, and they picked it because of that. They picked me because of that. Mm -hmm. 
I guess it's possible that they could choose a writer with no book if the writer had maybe a book in con under contract. But I think that, that so far they've picked people with books. Mark, so, Mark Richard was one, Steve Yarbrough. But how many places have you done this? How many times have, been, have you been able to go to this well? <laughs> Three times. I have been the Philip Roth resident in creative writing, okay. the John and Renee Grisham mm -hmm. resident in, in creative writing, and the Tennessee Williams Fellow in fiction. I've gone from Roth to Grisham to Williams. <laughs> So I, I've been a lot of people. So who's next? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, I think I'm, I'm settled now. I think we're uh, this we're this though is being being called uh, one of the great uh, sleeper books of the summer. How how do you know that the the publisher is feeling good about it? How can you tell when a publisher feels good about a book that you? They have just been really supportive of it, um, and. Uh, um, it's kind of a joke, but you, you can tell by, by the level of the hotels they put you in. I've, been, I've stayed in really nice hotels on my book tour so far. I've been in great hotels, you know, with mini bars, like that. I mean, all that stuff. And you, you know, get to travel I, all yes, around the country? Oh, I've been in, in, in L.A., in Portland, Oregon, Seattle. And what happens with the book now? I mean, this, the writing is so, so spectacular and visual that there have to be people who are interested in taking this thing further and... Yeah, there have been a couple of, of nibbles so far. It's, it's still, I think it's still early. And then do you have a, a hand in that, or do you, are, are you like John? You, you, you walk away. Grisham says he doesn't want anything to do with those Hollywood people. I would love to, to be as involved as it let me. I mean, I'm a huge movie fan. I'd love to try to write the screenplay. I'd love to go watch him shoot it and hang out with movie stars. I would like that. <laughs> and have, have food catered. You know. <laughs> I would love that. It's a recurring theme. This is good. Uh, <laughs> so what happens next? What do you, where are you now? What, do you, what, what are you doing now? Well, right now... You have um, this little kiddo at home and a wife who's publishing, and, a, and she's teaching at the university, and you are teaching two classes this year? Is that right? Well, excuse me. She is um, a tenure-track assistant professor at Ole Miss now, Beth Ann is, and they call me a writer-in-residence. Barry Hanna is the writer-in-residence. He's the one who's there permanently. I'm, I'm, I'm year to year, you know, a utility infielder. I'll fill in if they need me. Or I'll teach a graduate workshop here and there, like that. They have, they're keeping me because they want her. <laughs> I think that's what, that's what but, the truth is. But the question is, are you writing? And what are you writing? I sold another book to William Morrow, you know, my, my wonderful publisher. I'm just I'm, you know, amazed by them, by their generosity and, and their, their faith. I mean, they bought a book that I haven't um, gotten very far into yet. It doesn't have a title even. And, uh, and they bought it. Uh, I think you know they want to have a relationship with me, and I know I want to have one with them. And you know, and they're pushing this book so well shows me that they're really interested. True and story that you're working on. Another. It's 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 not true, and it's not historical. I'm never again writing anything set prior to 1970. Why? Because I almost never finish this trying to get the details right. Um, you know, I would write a scene with a coyote in it. And someone would tell me later there were no coyotes in Alabama at that time. Same with armadillos. I had a great armadillo scene that I had to cut out because there were no armadillos in Alabama in 1897. There were no egrets, cowbirds. You know, I had egrets sitting on a, on a, on a cow's shoulder. And Hardy Jackson read it and said, you know, there weren't egrets here yet. They were blown up in the 50s from Africa in a hurricane. <laughs> so, I, I, you, know, every, you know, I couldn't let a character zip his pants because I didn't know if they had zippers or not right. in those days. Mm -hmm. Someone sent me a Sears catalog, a facsimile, from 1897, and that, I used that to get details of clothing, of firearms, wagons, saddles, uh, tools, home remedies. Well, that's how Elmore Leonard wrote all those westerns all those years ago, you know. It he, was a godsend He told me, me once that he, he got the Arizona Magazine. That, remember that Arizona yeah, Highways yeah. Magazine that, that was out for all those years? And he would sit there and look at the pictures, and that's where he got his images, this kid guy sitting up there in Detroit writing commercials one day and writing westerns <laughs> the next. The pictures are also, you know, were also a big help for me. But so I'm writing something, you know, that I will know the details um, from my own life. Mm -hmm. And what's it about? Um, <laughs> it, it, if my editor is watching, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very far along we in it. We won't tell the editor. I'm very far along in it. Um, I'm 700 pages in. No, I'm not really sure what it's about yet. I think it's about two brothers, um, and I think one may have rabies. I think that that's you know be a nice 
device to create tension. <laughs> Do I have rabies or not? One, I don't one know. of those things. Uh, you've been involved too in this in this Blue Moon uh, project. Tell me about that. And will stories you be the, back. Yeah. yeah will stories you be back from the Blue Moon Cafe. Year? What is it about? I'm sorry. Uh, stories from the Blue Moon Cafe is uh, an anthology edited by Sonny Brewer, who has a wonderful bookstore down in Fairhope called uh, Over the Transom, and uh, the publisher is McAdam Cage out in San Francisco. And it's just an anthology of really eclectic writing. Most of it's Southern. I, I think not all of it is. Most of it is. And who was in the last one? Uh, well, the last one had uh, Rick Bragg, William Gay, George Singleton, Brad Watson, Jill Connor Brown, Pat Conroy. The list goes on and on. I'm not, you know. And also, what was great about it is it had writers that, you know, didn't have a book yet. You know, so are relative unknowns. You know, Sidney Thompson. Um, is a wonderful short story writer who's publishing stories, you know, all along, but hasn't had, you know, had the, hasn't had an editor smart, smart enough to buy his book yet, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's many, you know, many other people. So everybody contributes, but it also becomes kind of a road trip. When it yes, last year we, and this year we're doing it as well. Um, I think the first weekend in August, around August eighth, we'll be at Lemuria. Most of us, uh, there are going to be, gosh, twenty of us. Uh, and um, my, my wife, Bethany Finley, is also in the first one. And she and I are in the second one, too. I can't leave her out. Um, we, we did a signing. At, every, everyone in the book read at Lemuria last time, and, and we'll do it this time as well. And then we just take a trip up to Oxford. And do it all and over do, again. And do a signing up there. Oh, great. It's a treat to meet you. Oh, you too. Thank I enjoyed you. The Poachers very much. I like this, Hell at the Breach, a lot. It's a terrific book. Well, thank you, too. Can't, meet, can't wait to meet your wife and, and do something with the poetry book when it comes out, too. Great. Great. Tom thank Franklin, you. thank you. Thank you. And thank you. We'll see you next time.